All right, so today we're going to look at paper six, which is the alternative to the practical, or IGCSE chemistry. Okay, that's Cambridge International Examination, so CIE, and this is October, November 2018, variant one, so it's 0620 slash 61. That's a code. All right, let's get started. Let's get started. Question one. A student obtains pure dry samples of sand and sodium chloride from a mixture of sand and sodium chloride. So they went to the beach, got some salty sand, and then was able to separate the two of them. The student uses the apparatus shown. The method consists of six steps, A, B, C, D, E, and F, which are shown in the wrong order. That's these steps here. All right. So we need to order the steps in the method. All right. So step one has been given for you as A. So that happens first. So you have your mixture of sand and sodium chloride given to you. Okay, now what you want to do is you want to dissolve the salt in water. Okay, so we want to add water and stir. So that would be the second step. Okay, once we have our dissolved salt and our insoluble sand, we need to filter the two out. So this is our third step. Now, the fourth step, once we have filtered that out, would be to rinse off any extra salt that's sticking to the sides of the sand. Okay, so that's just rinsing off the salt residue that's stuck to the sand. Okay, now it doesn't really matter if you deal with the, the salty water or the sand first. Now you can either say this is step five and this is step six, or you could say this, this is step five and this is step six. It doesn't really matter. You can do them both at the same time. Just, you just have to choose one. All right, so let's write this in. Okay, so we can go, the first step is A, then it's C, then it's F, and then it is B, and then it's either D or E. Choose one though, don't do what I'm doing. Or it's E or D. Just choose one. All right, good. Next, B, complete the box to name the apparatus in D. Okay, so in this, app, in this box, we, have the we should have the label for an evaporating dish. Okay, that is a dish you use to evaporate. So you leave behind crystals. Okay, good, next. C. Why is the sand rinsed with water in B? And the reason why we rinse the sand with water, as we said, was to wash off any remaining salt residue that's already attached to the sand. So it's to wash off the remaining sodium chloride. So all the salt is in the water, in the filtrate, and the sand is pure sand. It doesn't include salt. Okay. D. Name the process in F. Okay. F is this process here, and that's filtration. So filtration. All right, so how could the purity of the sodium chloride obtained be checked? So how do you know how pure it is? So the, the way you tell the purity of, of a substance is you check the melting or boiling points. Now this is a solid, it doesn't boil unless you heat it really, really high. So you use the melting point. Question two, a student investigated the rate of reaction between dilute nitric acid and lumps of magnesium carbonate. The apparatus shown was used. All right, so they put the ni dilute nitric acid in there in the Erlenmeyer flask. They added lumps of magnesium carbonate to the bottom and it bubbled, it bubbled away. Carbonates can produce some carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide can escape out through the cotton wool, but all the bubbles aren't going to be splashed out and they weigh what the what the mass is as the reaction progresses okay so lumps of magnesium carbonate were added to a conical flask 40 centimeters cubed of dilute nitric acid was then poured into the conical flask using a measuring cylinder the magnesium carbonate was added in excess and that's important if the magnesium carbonate was added in excess there'll be a little bit left over that means all of the nitric acid will be used up. Okay, 
The conical flask was placed on a balance, cotton wool was placed in the top of the, cotton, of the conical flask, and the mass of the conical flask and its contents was measured, and a timer was started. The mass of the conical flask and its contents was measured every minute for seven minutes. A. Use the balance diagrams to record the mass of the conical flask and its contents in the table. Complete the table to work out the total loss of mass of the conical flask and its contents since the start of the experiment. Okay, so if you look at this, we have all our time at the, at the side. And if you look at this, this is our whole number. And it goes up by 0.2 of a gram until it gets to, eight, to the next number. Okay, so this is 86.0 grams. You don't put grams in because it's in the title. All right, so this is time zero. So we're looking for the total loss of mass in grams. And so at time zero, you have what you, you start with. There's nothing lost, okay? All right, this one is exactly on the line. It's 85.0. As this, this measure can measure in decimal points, then you have to have one decimal point. If there's one decimal point here, you should have one decimal point here. All right. Okay, so 85.0 is 1.0 grams down from 86. Okay, so here we have 84.4, because it's two lines above. 84.4 grams. And that is 1.6 grams lost. All right. So here we have 84.1 grams, okay, it's half a spot above, and so that is 1.9 grams, okay, and if you see here we have 84.0, and that is, as it started with 86.0, that is 2.0 grams lost, here we have 83.9 grams and so that is 2.1 grams lost okay and again we still have 83.9 and again we have 83.9 which is exactly the same all right okay b plot the results on the grid and draw a smooth line graph so a smooth line graph doesn't mean use a ruler unless it's completely straight you, you just do it freehand, okay? Do not join it dot for dot. You will lose marks for doing that because it says to draw a smooth line. All right. So looking at the scale at the bottom, we have nice, easy one minutes. And if you go up the y-axis here, you notice that you have to go 10 spots to go up 0.5 grams. That means every two squares is 0.1 grams. All right, so we can plot our, our data. Okay, so these are the points graphed, and if you notice, they're as close to the spot as you can. You have to be very careful, look very closely at it. Um, they will take marks off if one's uh, more than half a square away. And if you notice, I drew a little X. Examiners like to see X's or dots with a circle around it so that they can see exactly where they're supposed to, to be. Do not draw just a line of dots because when you draw a line through it, finding those dots can be really tricky. Okay, examiners like to, to know that you know exactly what you're talking about. And if you notice, it says on in the instructions, draw a smooth line graph. So here we're going to draw our smooth line graph. All right, that's pretty good. Um, if you notice, I didn't use a ruler on any part of this, which means there's a little bit of wobble. It's just the way that it works if you don't use a ruler but the examiners will take marks off if you use a ruler and it's not meant to be a perfectly straight line. Okay, moving on. Okay, C, the average rate of reaction can be calculated using the equation shown. So the average rate of reaction equals the total loss of mass in grams divided by the time taken in seconds. Calculate the average rate of reaction for the first 30 seconds of the reaction and to deduce the unit. Okay, so in the first 30 seconds of the reaction, that is half a minute. So if we take this half a minute, we go to the half point. Okay, we go up. And where does the line meet? Okay, the lines meet at about just under, just above 0.5. Now we're only doing this to one decimal place. 
So 0.5 is the answer. Okay, it's the answer for that. All right. So looking at this equation, the average rate of reaction equals the total loss of mass in grams at, at 30 seconds. So that was 0 0.5 grams divided by time in seconds. So that's 30 seconds. Okay, so if we plug that into the, our calculator, we will get 0 0.017 and the units are grams per second. Okay, so 0 0.017 grams second eight minus one, or you, you could write grams per second. It says so in the equation. Okay, next. D, the experiment is repeated using an excess of powdered magnesium carbonate. All the other conditions are kept the same. Sketch on the grid the graph you would expect. Okay, so the more magnesium, if you have more magnesium carbonate, the reaction will go faster. But it says that all the other conditions are kept the same, so the nitric acid is the same, which means it's only going to react to the same level. It's not going to go higher. It's just going to go faster to start with, but it's not going to go farther. There's only so much nitric acid that can react. So to sketch the graph that you would expect, I would say something like this would work. Okay. So we could say that this is with excess powdered magnesium carbonate. And you might want to work to make your line a little tiny bit less wobbly. Okay, but the key is, is that it goes faster to start with, but it doesn't go any higher than the original experiment. So this little bit there it kind of goes up and then down a bit. You want to make that a little bit flatter. All right, good. E1, why does the mass of the conical flask and its contents decrease? Okay, the reason why it decreases is because the reaction produces a gas, and gases can escape, but they also have a mass. Okay, so the reason why it decreases is because carbon dioxide gas was given off. So carbon dioxide gas was given off. And two, suggest the purpose of the cotton wool. Okay, the cotton wool allows the gas to escape, but doesn't let any bubbles of acid escape. So it allowed the gas to escape, but prevented the loss of acid. All right. Three, why does the graph level off? Explain your answer. Okay, the reason why it leveled off is because all of the nitric acid was finished reacting. So basically that meant the reaction is complete. So remember the magnesium carbonate was in excess. That means that it ma made sure that all of the nitric acid was gonna react. All right, F, give one advantage and one disadvantage of using a burette instead of a measuring cylinder to add the dilute nitric acid to the conical flask. Okay, so the advantage is clearly that it's much more accurate. Burettes are a very accurate way of measuring liquids. So it's much, more accurate. And the disadvantage is it, it's, it's slower. Okay, it takes longer for the, the liquid to drain out of the, out of the pipette. Okay, keep in mind when you're talking about a burette, there are different sizes of burettes. You can have burettes that go to five milliliters or you can have burettes that go to 50 milliliters or 100 milliliters. So there's much, there's a lot of variation in burette. So you don't, it, you, it's not that you ha will necessarily have to use, refill it more than once. Three, two solid salts, solid G and solid H were analyzed. Tests were done on each solid. So we're gonna look at solid G first. So some of the tests and observations on solid G are, are shown. So test one, a flame test was done on solid G and the result was a lilac color. And test two, it, solid G was dissolved in distilled water and then dilute hydrochloric acid was added to the solution. The solution was warmed gently and then it, 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 the gas that was produced was tested with filter paper, which had been dipped in acidified aqueous potassium manganate. Okay, and what it did there was it 
uh, turn the filter paper from purple to colorless. All right, so let's look at the questions. Okay, A, name the gas produced in test two. Okay, test two is, that's really the test for sulfur dioxide. B, identify solid G. Okay, solid G is potassium sulfite. And you know this because the lilac color is the flame test to produce potassium. Okay, and sulfite, the test for sulfite is you add dilute hydrochloric acid and uh, sulfur dioxide gas is given off. So that's, that did happen. Okay, if it was sulfate, they'd need to, you'd need to add dilute nitric acid and then aqueous barium nitrate and then a white precipitate would form. So it's a completely, completely different test for sulfate. All right. Tests on solid H now. Okay, solid H was calcium nitrate. All right, complete the expected observations. Solid H was added to distilled water in a test tube. The test tube was shaken and, dissol and to dissolve the solid H, and the solution was divided into four portions in four test tubes. Okay, so that's four separate tests, really. So C1, drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide were added to the first portion of, of the solution. Okay, what you'd expect to see there is a white precipitate. All right, so an excess of aqueous sodium hydroxide was then added to the mixture from C1. And what you should see there is if it's calcium nitrate, you should see that there's really no change. All right. So D. An excess of aqueous ammonia was added to the second portion of the solution. With that, you should see no precipitate. Again. Okay, and E, dilute nitric acid and aqueous silver nitrate were added to the third portion of the solution. And again, you should see no precipitate. Don't forget, so it's, it remains colorless as well. So don't forget the nitric acid and aqueous silver nitrate, that's uh, to test for halide ions, and there's no halide ions in calcium nitrate. Okay, aluminum foil and aqueous sodium hydroxide were added to the fourth portion of the solution, and the mixture was warmed, and the gas produced was tested. Okay, so what, they would, what you'd use is you'd use litmus paper, and, you'd, and it would turn blue. Okay, so you'd use litmus paper and it would turn blue. Okay, you could also say it had a strong smell. Okay, don't you can't say in an observation that it was alkaline because that is an explanation. An observation is what you see or what you smell or what you hear or feel or something like that, what you observe, not what you know. Okay, now the reason for these tests, remember for the calcium ion, if you add sodium hydroxide, then a white precipitate forms. And this white precipitate is insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide. Okay, and to test for the nitrate, aqueous sodium hydroxide is added and then aluminum, aluminum. This makes ammonia gas given off. And that's a strong smell and ammonia gas is alkaline. So it turns uh, litmus paper blue. All right, next. Question four, propanone and ethyl ethanoate are both solvents which can be used to remove paint. Plan an investigation to, de to determine which of these two solvents is better to use to remove paint. You are, pro you are provided with glass slides, paint, the two solvents and common laboratory apparatus. Okay, so the first thing you'd want to do is paint the glass sides with the same thickness of paint. Okay, so paint the glass slides with the same thickness, so the same. You don't want to add different thicknesses of paint. You might want to do this by weighing the glass, slide, sl sl glass slides first, then painting it, and then weighing it again to make sure that it is the same, same thickness. But keep in mind, this is only six marks worth, and you need to keep adding lots of stuff. Okay, once it's painted, then you leave it to dry. So you leave the slides to dry. After that, you add drops of propanone, propanone to one of the slides, 
until the paint coating is removed. Okay, so wh while you're doing this, you count the number of drops that you're adding. Okay, so you count the drops as they're being added, or you can measure the final volume that was, at that was added. Okay, then you repeat the procedure with ethyl ethanoate. Okay, so you repeat the re procedure with ethyl ethanoate. And then you compare the number of drops that are required for each solvent. The one with the fewest drops needed is one that's best to remove paint. Okay, so you compare the number of drops required. The solvent with the fewest drops is better to remove paint. Okay, so a few notes on this. Um, you, when you're answering this question, you need to make sure you show that you know how to make it a, a fair test. So you need to make sure you use the same thickness of paint. You add drops of propanone, so you count them in the same way, that sort of thing. So you're repeating the procedure, this, doing it the same way. Okay. Another thing which will often give you marks for these sorts of questions, but actually isn't, they aren't marks on this one, but I would always include them because they're, they're often free marks, is you say, repeat and take the average. or repeat twice and take the average. So you have three trials. And another thing which often is included in these experiment designs, but isn't on this one, is safety measures. So you put in some sort of safety measure. And in this one, I would say wear goggles because you're using strong solvents. Okay, and that is the end of this paper. I hope you have found this helpful. If you have, please like and uh, like the video and subscribe. We really appreciate it. And if you have any other questions or comments, please leave them in the discussion below. And have a great day.